السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام السلام عليكم Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome back to our academic activity. And today we will have three, three lectures. The first one about pericardial diseases will be presented by Dr. Anwar Al-Halaybi. Oh, the second lecture will be about cardiac tumors by Dr. Muhammad Al-Mutlaq. And it will end by a special presentation from Dr. Faisal Bakin from Cleveland Clinic. About cabbage. We will, would like also to welcome Dr. Faiz uh, Ahmed, who is a cardiac surgery consultant at King Fahad University Hospital, Khobar. We will start uh, five minutes past one, inshallah. Dr. Anwar, you can prepare your slides if you don't mind. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes,
You can hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, my slides is clear? Yes. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Um, Rahmatullah Barakatu, uh, it's Aid Lijamir. Uh, this is Anwar Hlebi, cardiac surgery resident from Saudi Baptine Cardiac Center. And today I will talk about uh, uh, pericardial disease. Uh, before starting my presentation, uh, I would, uh, uh, I would uh, like to thank Dr. Uh, Fayyad uh, for, his, uh, uh, for accept, accepting my invitation uh, for uh, supervise this lecture. Um, so as an introduction, uh, the pericardium envelops the heart and portion of the great vessels as the protective uh, capsule. And the surgical importance of the pericardium stems from its involvement in the alteration of cardiac filling. Uh, so when the, uh, when the limited space between the non-compliant pericardium and the heart acutely fills with the fluid, cardiac compression and tamponade uh, may occur. This is the outline for my presentation. Uh, I will talk about anatomy and function of the pericardium, the pathophysiology of pericardial compression, uh, congenital uh, anomalies of the pericardium, acquired anomalies, uh, pericardial imaging, and some of the operation uh, involving the pericardium. Uh, first, I will start with the anatomy and function of the pericardium. The pericardium, as you know, attaches to the ascending aorta just in, uh, inferior to the uh, innominent vein and the superior vena cava, uh, several centimeters uh, above the uh, SA node. And the uh, pericardium serves uh, two major functions. It will maintain the position of the heart within the mediastinum, and it will prevent the, the, the heart from distension by sudden volume overload. Uh, the pericardium is a conical fib uh, fibrocerous sac made up of two intimately connected layers. The inner layer, which is called the serous pericardium, and there is external layer, or what is called the fibrous pericardium. The inner layer is a transparent uh, monolayer of mesothelial cells, and it's uh, divided into visceral portion and uh, parietal portion. The parietal portion of the inner layer lines the fibrous pericardium sac, and both of them are continuous. This layer facilitates the fluid and ion exchange, and it allows the pericardium to expand and accommodate a limited amount of fluid, which is usually between 10 to 20 ml. Uh, the second layer, the fibrous pericardium, is composed mostly of dense parallel bundles of collagen, which renders uh, this layer relatively non-compliant. And because the pericardium is stiffer than the cardiac muscle, it tends to equalize the compliance of both ventricles. So by doing this, uh, the pericardium contributes to the resting cavitary diastolic pressure or the uh, uh, filling pressure of both ventricles. So it, this will maximize the diastolic ventricular interaction. We will speak about it in the upcoming slides. Uh, so an example of this phenomena is the diminution of the systemic arterial uh, pressure during inspiration uh, through uh, in which the intrapericardial pressure tends to approximate the pleural pressure and that is uh, with respiration. So during the inspiration, uh, the negative intrathoracic pressure will, uh, will be generated, and this will augment the right ventricular filling. So this will lead to uh, the, uh, the septum, the interventricular septum will be shift leftward to accommodate the increased right ventricular filling, and therefore it will lead to impairment of the LV filling. And this will, uh, this impairment of the LV filling will translate to decrease in cardiac output and the slight diminution in the systemic blood pressure during inspiration. Um, uh, this phenomena is greatly magnified with an increase in intrapericardial pressure. Uh, for example, uh, during acute filling of the pericardial space, uh, resulting in pulses paradox which is uh, a difference in the, uh, or decrease in the, uh, in, uh, in the systolic blood pressure uh, during inspiration uh, uh, about uh, for more than 10 uh, millimeter mercury. Uh, so two, there, were, there will be two identifiable recess uh, lie within the pericardium and are lined by the serous layer. And uh, the first one is the transverse sinuses uh, as you can see in the picture, this is the transverse sinus, this one. 
and this uh, sinus will be delineated anteriorly by the posterior surface of the aorta and pulmonary trunk and posteriorly by the anterior surface of the interatrial groove. The second one, the second recess is the oblique sinuses, uh, sinus, and this is it. And this sinus will locate uh, behind the left atrium, uh, and it is delineated by the serous pericardial reflection of, from the pulmonary veins and the inferior vena cava. So the oblique sinuses, uh, sinus will lie within the venous confluence, which is the left atrium and the SPC. Uh, whereas the transverse sinus will lie bet between the arterial confluence, uh, which is the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Um, uh, the blood supply, innervation, and the lymphatic drainage of the uh, pericardial. Uh, the pericardium will be supplied by the uh, pericardiophrenic arteries that, uh, uh, that travel within the phrenic nerve. And the, uh, uh, the second one is the branches of the internal mammary artery. And sometimes there will, there will be a feeder branches directly from the aorta, which can refuse the pericardium. The, the, the innervation is by the vagal fibers from the esophageal plexus and the phrenic nerves uh, course within it. And the lymphatic drainage uh, for the visceral pericardial will be via the tracheal and the bronchial medi mediastinal nodes. Uh, nodes. Uh, however, uh, for the lymphatic drainage for the parietal pericardium will occur uh, via the anterior and posterior mediastinal lymph nodes. Um, the pathophysiology of pericardial uh, compression. Pericardial compression will result from disturbance of the normal anatomical and physiological relationship between the pericardium, pericardial cavity, and the heart. Because the pericardium is slightly, uh, is relatively non-compliant and the pericardial fluid is non-compressible, the heart alone must compensate for the acute changes in the pericardial pressure, in which, uh, as we can see in this uh, diagram, in the, under normal circumstances, the pericardium will tolerate a small amount of fluid uh, with, an, uh, with minimal increase in the intrapericardial pressure. However, if this if, uh, fluid or volume reach the limit of pericardial stretching, so acute increase in the volume uh, within the pericardial space will result in a rapid nonlinear increase in the intrapericardial pressure, producing cardiac compression. Uh, however, in the chronic situation where there is a gradual accumulation of a fluid, the pericardial space will accommodate a much larger volume of fluid up to the critical uh, pressure. It can accommodate up to one liter if it is a chronic uh, conditions. Uh, so the anatomical basis for pericardial compression involves either a space occupying lesion within the pericardial space, either fluid or cyst, or pericardial constriction. We will start first with the tamponade. Um, although blood uh, in the pericardial space is the most common etiology, uh, the clots, pus, gas, or any combination of these can also produce tamponade. So as a fluid entering the pericardial space rapidly exceeds the pericardial reserve volume, as it was explained before in the diagram, intrapericardial pressure will rise abruptly. So at this point, the pericardial fluid volume can only increase by reducing the cardiac chamber volumes. Uh, and because the right, the right side of the heart ha ha has uh, a lower filling pressure, it will be more susceptible to compression. And the physiological consequences are impaired. Uh, the diastolic filling would decrease the cardiac output and increase the central venous pressure. So the clinical manifestation of tamponade include, includes the big triad, which involves the hypotension, uh, central venous distension, and decreased uh, or muffled heart sound. So to preserve, um, to preserve the cardiac output, higher pressure uh, will be required to fill the cardiac chamber. And this uh, may be partially achieved by increasing the systemic and pulmonary venous pressure by vasoconstriction. And uh, there is other compensatory mechanism like tachycardia uh, and blood volume uh, expansions, however, uh, and pericardial st stretch also. However, uh, the last two mechanisms have a little impact in the acute uh, uh, stages of tamponade. 
so as tamponade progress, the right side uh, filling pressure becomes increasingly volume dependent and will, it will be limited to inspiration uh, because the bricardial pressure will be low. Uh, so this will lead, uh, if the right uh, ventricular uh, filling pressure is increasing, the, the septum will be shifted to the left side, and this will impair the left ventricular filling. However, during expiration, the converse is true. The left ventricular filling pressure uh, will be more, so the cardiac output will increase. Uh, so this exaggeration of this physiology, uh, physiological of this ventricular interdependence is the basis of Balsas paradox. Um, the clinical presentation of tamponade will vary widely depending on the severity of hemodynamic impairment and the degree of physiological reserve. So as I said before, rapid accumulation of uh, as little as 100 ml of fluid in the pericardial space may exceed the limit of compliance of the parietal pericardium and produce uh, critical tamponade. Uh, on the other uh, hand, in, in chronic inflammatory conditions, uh, like in rheumatoid arthritis, the pericardium may compensate for a large pericardial effusion, even exceeding one liter. Uh, there is uh, what is called low pressure tamponade. So what is this? Uh, it is a tamponade, uh, however, uh, in which the pericardial effusion is not hemodynamically significant until the patient is become hypovolemic, either because of dehydration, blood loss, or diuretic uh, therapy. Uh, the venous filling pressure may be normal here or mildly elevated, and this will make the diagnosis of this condition is very difficult. Um, uh, we finished from the tamponade. The second one is the pericardial constriction. Uh, a variety of conditions can promote pericardial scar formation, and uh, which is the pathological process underlying uh, constrictive pericarditis. And this pathological process, uh, the etiology of this pathological process has shifted over time with declining incidence of infectious cases like TB and increasing incidence of iatrogenic uh, cases like mediastinal radiation therapy and cardiac surgery, post-cardiac surgery. So as with tamponade, uh, the physiological basis is compromised cardiac filling leading to systemic venous congestion and low cardiac output. However, in contrast with tamponade, this condition is often insidious and symptoms may be present for months to two years. And the common complaint will be fatigue, decreased exercise tolerance with dyspnea, orthopnea, as well as peripheral edema and ascites uh, from hepatic congestion in advanced disease. Uh, so pericardial constriction exerts its pathological effects by limiting the cardiac filling. Uh, and unlike tamponade, uh, in which in tamponade, the, the, the uh, cardiac filling will be limited from the onset uh, of diastole. However, in pericardial constriction, uh, the early diastole will not, uh, will not be restricted uh, from filling. Le however, later in diastole, the filling if the ventricles are prevented from reaching full capacity as they encounter the contracted non-compliant pericardium. So as a result, uh, 70 to 80% of diastolic filling uh, will occur in the first, in the early diastole, in the first 25 to 30% of the diastole, after which the diastolic pressure will increase abruptly. Then the ventricular free wall will be immobilized, uh, leaving the interventricular septum uh, as a last uh, yielding structure, which is rapidly displaced to the left side and uh, uh, this will produce the characteristic septal pound seen in echo. Uh, this picture will uh, demonstrate the characteristic the septal pounds, uh, which is seen in the echo. The first one here is the during inspiration, and the second one is during expiration. Uh, other echo findings include pericardial thickening, caval brethora, and the small chamber uh, uh, volumes. And there is also, we can see uh, through Doppler echo, we can uh, see the reciprocal Doppler flow between the uh, right and so left sided uh, through the uh, tricuspid and the mitral valves. And this correlates with the basal paradox. Uh, modern axial imaging with CT and MRI are often able to visualize the thickened and or calcified pericardium with or without uh, coexisting effusion. 
um, uh, there is uh, something important that uh, although pericardial thickening is usually present in constructive pericarditis, it is possible to have uh, constructive pericarditis with normal pericardial thickness, as well as sometimes there is pericardial thickening without constructive pericarditis. Uh, prior to the modern era of echo and axial imaging, the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis was dependent on the uh, hemodynamic tracing uh, obtained during cardiac cath. So we can see um, uh, in the in the uh, in the um, uh, there is there will be a sudden increase in the diastolic ventricular pressure in the uh, right-sided uh, tracing in the cath lab, uh, and this is called the dip and plateau or square root sign. And also in the right atrial pressure tracing, we can see a steep wide descent uh, for uh, this wave. And uh, the the pathophysiology of this, as uh, I explained before. Um, uh, there is what is called also a chasmal sign, uh, which is uh, in distension of the neck veins during inspiration in patients with constrictive, uh, constrictive pericarditis due to the high pressure of pericardial constriction, which prevents the right atrium from accepting more inspiratory acceleration of blood from the central veins. Um, what is the difference between constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy? Restrictive cardiomyopathy is characterized by non-compliant ventricle, uh, ventricular muscle, and diastolic dysfunction, which impedes the cardiac filling. It is caused by a variety of infiltrative uh, diseases like amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, radiations, and carcinoid. Although uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy may mimic many of the presenting features of constrictive pericarditis, it is not a surgical disease and therefore must, it must be distinguished from uh, constrictive pericarditis. Uh, this table will uh, show the difference between the pericardial constriction and restrictive cardiomyopathy, uh, in which Pulsus paradox is uh, usually present in pericardial uh, constriction. However, it is uh, usually absent in restrictive cardiomyopathy. Pericardial knock is usually present in constriction. However, it is absent in restrictive cardiomyopathy. S3 sound is usually present in uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy, indicating heart failure, and usually uh, absent in constriction. Um, and the hemodynamics of the prominent wide descent is usually present in the constriction and the variable in the restrictive type. Uh, and equalization of the right and left side filling breather are usually present in the uh, uh, constriction. However, the left side is more than uh, pressure, is more than the right side in restrictive cardiomyopathy. The pulmonary hypertension is usually common in the restrictive type and rare in the constrictive type. The square root, time, uh, root sign is usually uh, uh, present in the constriction and uh, variable in the restrictive type. And the atrial enlargement, it will be bilateral uh, in the restrictive type and uh, variable in the rest constrictive type. Uh, uh, also, the constrictive type, we usually see a small cardiac chamber. It will not be enlarged in many cases. The pericardial thickening is usually uh, increased in constrictive type, and this is usually normal in the restrictive type. And you can review the, uh, the table later also. Um, we finished from the first objective. Now uh, we will uh, start with, um, I will talk about some of the congenital and the acquired abnormalities. The congenital abnormalities of the pericardium are asymptomatic and are often incidentally discovered at the time of surgery or investigation of, under, uh, of unrelated problems. Uh, they are uh, rare and one third are associated with cardiac, skeletal, and pulmonary abnormalities. The first one is the pericardial cyst. So this is the most common uh, congenital pericardial disorder, uh, surpassed uh, only by lymphoma. They occur as asymptomatic incidental finding in 75% of the patient. 70% 70, uh, 70 occur in the right costophrenic angle and 22% uh, uh, only in the left. They don't communicate with the pericardial space and they are typically unilocular, smooth, and less than 3 cm in diameter. Uh, when the patient uh, is symptomatic, the symptoms usually involve chest pain, dyspnea, cough, and arrhythmias and they can also become secondary infected. Uh, 
The contrast CT is the imaging modality of choice for diagnosis and surveillance. And observation with serial CT in asymptomatic patients is usually appropriate. Precutaneous aspiration is associated with 30% recurrence and three rates, uh, three years. And the indication for resection include larger sites, symptomatic patient, patient concern, and there is a question for, of malignancy. So, so the surgery is the only definitive cure. And the video assistant thoracoscopy is the surgical approach uh, that is most commonly used for excision. The second one is the partial absence of the pericardium. Uh, it is most commonly seen on the left side due to premature atrophy of the left common uh, cardinal vein. Uh, and the right-sided and complete defect of the pericardium account for 17 and 13 uh, percent of these defects, respectively. Uh, the right, in which the right side of Covier goes into to form the SBC and ensures the closure of the right pleuro-bericardial membrane. So the right side defects are uh, more uh, are tend to be more lethal. Uh, MRI is the magnetic is the imaging modality of choice here, but we can use also CT or, or echo. Uh, although complete pericardial agenesis is rare. Uh, is rarely clinical significance. Unilateral absence is potentially problematic because this may ex uh, accentuate the cardiac mobility. mobility. Uh, so the heart will be displaced into the pleural space with consequent incarceration of the left atrial appendage or the left ventricle. So the treatments may involve pericardial resection or placement with the prosthetic uh, badge over the defect. The acquired abnormalities, the most common uh, one is the pericardial disorders. Of pericardial disorder is pericarditis. And this table uh, showing the, the, the common etiologies of acute pericarditis. I will speak about some of them in the upcoming slides. Uh, the clinical syndrome uh, for all causes is similar, including chest pain, dull, uh, which is usually uh, pleuritic, and thus uh, it will be also ex exacerbated by inspiration, cuff, or recumbency. So these patients, uh, usually uh, you will see them uh, sit up and lean forwards for pain relief. And there is also constitutional uh, symptoms like weakness and malaise. Fever uh, occasionally will be present with rigors, and there is some other symptoms like cough or uh, odonophagia. Uh, acute disease, disease may become chronic, and the cardinal signs for pericarditis is the pericardial rub, which may be positional and muffled because uh, of coexisting uh, effusion. The ECG may range from normal to non-specific ST segment deviation to diffuse concave elevation of the ST segment without reciprocal depression or Q waves. BR uh, segment may be depressed, uh, and ventricular arrhythmias and conduction abnormalities are uncommon, and if they uh, present, they are uh, subjective uh, of underlying cardiac abnormalities. Troponin may be elevated with normal CBK, and echo may reveal fibrinous thickening of the pericardium with or without small effusion. Uh, NSAIDs are the ministry of treatment, uh, although recent studies uh, support the routine use of colchicine, in which there is a large multicenter randomized control trial uh, for which a patient with the first attack of pericarditis were randomized to conventional anti-inflammatory with either placebo or colchicine, and this demonstrates a significant reduction in rates of the incident or recurrent pericarditis in those patients who received colchicine. Um, so chronic pericardial effusion or uh, constrictive pericarditis may follow acute pericarditis, uh, as well as the TB, the malignancy, and the radiation and uh, chronic uh, diseases or surgery. The chronic relapsing pericarditis that fails medical therapy it can be uh, managed surgically with pericardiectomy. Uh, I will start with the in, infectious uh, pericarditis, the, vi the viral one. It is the most common form, and it results from immune, uh, immune complex deposition uh, or direct or direct uh, viral attack, or it can be both of them. It's often difficult to diagnose, and therefore it will be labeled as idiopathic. And the treatment is expecting and symptomatic only. And usually the symptoms will, will be uh, resolved within two weeks. And the surgical intervention is rarely required. 
Uh, the bacterial pericarditis, this is uncommon because of the effective antibiotic therapy. Uh, the micro, uh, micro uh, organism may invade the pericardium space uh, from contiguous infection like uh, in the heart, such as endocarditis, from the adjacent structure as the lung, like pneumonia or abscess, or from the subdiaphragmatic space, like uh, in cases of liver or splenic abscess. And from or from the wounds, any wounds, traumatic or surgical, and uh, sometimes uh, the hematogenous seeding may also be uh, seen in the setting of bacteremia and immune compromise. And the most common bacteria uh, are Haemophilus influenza, meningococci, pneumococci, staphylococci, or streptococci. However, uh, uh, gram-negative rods, Salmonella, and opportunistic infection must be excluded, uh, especially in immune compromised patients. Uh, so, the regardless of the source of the organism, uh, acute suburative pericarditis is life-threatening and it's usually uh, present as a toxic presentation with high fever and uh, as uh, uh, with high fever and the other symptoms as we discussed for the general pericarditis. Uh, Burent pericarditis with tamponade or septicemia may require acute surgical intervention via pericardial uh, window. Uh, or pericardiectomy and treatment of the inciting cause. This is very important. We should remove uh, any uh, any cause that can uh, the source of the infection. Uh, TB pericarditis. Although the incidence of TB has significantly declined in the industrialized countries, it has dramatically uh, increased in Africa, Asia, Latin America, accounting for ninety five percent of all cases of active TB. Uh, and the immune response is to the acid uh, fa fast bacilli, uh, which will penetrate the pericardium, will induce a delayed hypersensitivity reaction with lymphokine release and granuloma formation. Uh, so the, the cause of oxidative TB pericarditis is a complement fixing antibodies, which will initiate cytolysis, uh, which, uh, which is mediated by the anti, uh, anti myolimmal antibodies. And the definitive diagnosis is established for this TB pericarditis is by examining the pericardial or the pericardial fluid for mycobacteria. Uh, there is four pathological states uh, for TB pericarditis. The first one is the fibrinous exudation with robust polymorphonuclear infiltration. The second one is the serous or sinusanguinous effusion, which is mainly lymphocytic uh, exudation and form cells. The third one is the absor uh, absorption of effusion, which is uh, with organizing of caseating uh, granuloma. And the last one is the constrictive scarring. And this often will uh, uh, usually present with extensive calcification uh, that occur over a period of years. So despite prompt anti-TB antibiotic therapy, uh, constrictive pericarditis uh, occur in 30 to 60% of the patients. And the start, uh, standard anti-TB therapy is, uh, should be initiated uh, uh, promptly. A steroid remain controversial, especially in HIV-infected patients. And based on the physiology and response to therapy, immediate or interval uh, pericardiectomy is performed to avoid uh, chronic uh, constrictive pericarditis. However, if calcific pericarditis is present and the patient is symptomatic, surgery is, uh, must be undertaken earlier. Uremic pericarditis, uh, it, is, uh, it was uh, recognized in the 1836. Uh, and although uh, the, the, the elevated blood urea nitrogen more than 60% is required for uremic pericarditis, the inciting agent remains unknown. And the clinical profile typically uh, involves a patient with a chronic renal failure who develop pain, fever, and friction rub. And there is usually a pericardial fluid collection, which may be exudative or transudative and is often hemorrhagic. So initial therapy includes NSAIDs and aggressive dialysis. And pericardial drainage is reserved for cases of tamponade or refractory effusions more than two weeks despite the intensive uh, dialysis. Uh, radiation pericarditis, this is the most common etiology uh, of uh, constrictive pericarditis in the United States. A radiation can induce acute pericarditis, pancarditis, accelerated coronary artery disease in a dose-dependent relationship. 
and patients may present with a combination of precardial constriction, restrictive cardiomyopathy, valvular heart disease, and coronary artery disease with predilection of osteal uh, lesion. Uh, so, when symptomatic uh, fusions are drained, fluid should be analyzed to clarify the etiology, if it is either uh, radiation effect or due to malignancy. And constrictive pericarditis can develop after radiation uh, for after several years, and it's best treated uh, by pericardiectomy. Neoplastic pericarditis, uh, the secondary neoplasm of the pericardium, it accounts more uh, common than the primary uh, pericardial uh, tumors, and it accounts for more than 95% of pericardial neoplastic disease. And the most common secondary tumors uh, in the males are carcinoma of the lung, esophagus, and lymphoma. And in females are carcinoma of the lung, lymphoma, and carcinoma of the breast. Benign tumors are generally seen in infancy or childhood, and malignant tumors like mesothelioma, sarcomas, and angiosarcomas are typically present in the third or fourth decades of life. Uh, the clinical presentation uh, is usually silent and may be associated with large pericardial effusion. Tamponade can result from hemorrhage into malignant effusion, and occasionally tumor can also uh, produce constriction because of the adhesions and the new plastic tissue. The role of surgery here is limited to diagnosis and palliation uh, in most cases. Uh, uh, however, large refractory fusion uh, associated with tamponade may need surgical drainage. And uh, in cases of uh, pericardial construction, uh, there will be an extensive resection and debulking uh, in, in, in cases of persistent or recurrent malignant pericardial construction. Uh, however, uh, only transient benefit without adj adjunctive uh, chemotherapy and or radiation therapy. Um, the, uh, the next one is the traumatic pericardial conditions. Uh, we will start, there is penetrating the trauma and there is blunt trauma. Penetrating the trauma, uh, in penetrating the trauma, uh, the, uh, the tamponade is more common in stab wounds than the gunshot wounds. And the right ventricle is almost often uh, involved uh, uh, in anterior chest wounds. And the diagnosis is often made on clinical grounds supplemented by ultrasound. Uh, and the unstable patient should undergo thoracotomy in the ER. However, the stable patient can be explored in the operating room. Uh, in this, uh, in this uh, situation, the timing of induction of anesthesia is critical because anesthetic induction can lead to hemodynamic collapse in the setting of tamponade and the preload dependence. So the patient should be positioned, ripped, and draped before induction of the anesthesia in order to allow prompt uh, opening of the chest and pericardium if the patient is uh, rapidly deteriorated. Uh, blunt uh, trauma. Uh, the blunt cardiac and pericardial injury rarely occur in isolation. And the trauma is usually owing to compression, uh, such as in a CBR, a blast, and deceleration, which can produce a spectrum of uh, injuries ranging from cardiac contusions to cardiac rupture and pericardial laceration with herniation or relaxation of the heart. Hypovolemia uh, may lead to rapid decompensation because the cardiac filling becomes increasingly volume dependent. And these patients may initially respond to volume resuscitation. Just imaging may de demonstrate displacement of the heart or free air or intra-abdominal organs within the pericardium. And uh, if the heart is herniating, we can position the, the patient on the, with the contralateral side uh, uh, down, uh, which may reduce the herniation. And th thoracotomy is the required for definitive treatment and repair of associated injuries. Uh, now we will talk about the acute post-infarction pericarditis and Drisler syndrome. Post-infarction pericarditis is thought to occur in almost half of patients suffering a transmural myocardial infarction, although it will be symptomatic in far fewer. And the incidence of this is decreasing because of more aggressive revascularization in recent decades. Chest pain is almost universally present, and it is therefore important to distinguish the pain of pericarditis from the ischemic pain, because this will lead to unnecessarily early operation after MI. 
So the pain of early post-MI, pericarditis occur in the first 24 to 70, uh, 72 hours, and it is always pleuritic in nature and tend to decrease in intensity when the patient sits up and lean forward. Um, Drizzler syndrome is a diffuse pleuropericardial inflammation thought to have an autoimmune etiology that occur weeks to months after infarction, um, and, and pericardial lump and diffusion may be present, but the tamponade is rare, rare here. Pleural rub and diffusion can also be present, and the ECG signs of pericarditis may be obscured by those of the infarction. Uh, post mi pericarditis is typically treated with aspirin and or NSAIDs. Steroid or colchicine may be used for persistent or recurrent symptoms. However, it has been found that steroid use is associated with recurrent pericarditis. Uh, now, cardiac surgery and the pericardium. Um, post operative pericardial effusion and post uh, pericardiectomy syndrome. Uh, the pericardial effusion not infrequently developed following cardiac surgery, which occurring in 1 to 6% of the patients. And they range from so uh, small, asymptomatic, and clinically insignificant effusion to large effusion that cause dyspnea, malaise, chest pain, or syncopal or presyncopal attack. Risk factor for this uh, is increased body service area, pulmonary embolism, immunosuppression, surgery time, if it is heart transplant or uh, aortic aneurysm surgery, increased uh, cardiopulmonary bypass time, the urgency of surgery, and renal failure. How to manage the large symptomatic effusions? Uh, if it is uh, early, within uh, seven days post-op, we can uh, do it by surgical drainage. Uh, however, if it is late, uh, more than seven days post-op, uh, pericardiosynthesis can be done for the patient. Um, uh, prevention of post-op pericardial effusion and post pericardiotomy uh, syndrome has been also studied. And it has been found that post-op cautious administration has been shown to reduce the incidence of post pericardiotomy syndrome and pericardial effusion and its routine use post-op should be considered. However, pre-op uh, administration of cautious uh, can also uh, reduce the rate of post pericardiotomy syndrome. However, there is an increased incidence of adverse uh, GI effects and the drug discontinuation which limits its beneficial effects. Uh, post-operative tamponade, uh, early post-operative tamponade rarely goes undetected for a long time because the high uh, level of vigilance and the close hemodynamic monitoring for the patient uh, during this time. So the vital feature of post-op tamponade, which is a circumferential fluid collection, is not required for compromised cardiac function post-op. So hemodynamic deterioration can occur in the setting of localized clot within the pericardium, particularly if it is impinging upon the right-sided uh, heart. Uh, uh, this is regarding the early. The late cardiac tamponade uh, that present after the hospital discharge uh, is potentially lethal complication and occurs in 0.5 to 6% of patients after cardiac surgery and almost exclusively in those uh, people with anticoagulation. It is more common in younger patients following isolated bulk surgery. A uh, patient uh, will, be, will present on average of three weeks after surgery, frequently in the setting of an elevated prothrombin time. They are often severely symptomatic with declining exercise tolerance, dyspnea, oliguria, or anuria, and uh, hypotension sometimes. So any patient on anticoagulation whose recovery takes an otherwise unexplained de de decline in this interval should be suspected of having late tamponade and should uh, undergo echo examination. And nearly all patients with late tamponade respond uh, to pericardiosynthesis and can safely resume their anticoagulation. Uh, pericardial imaging, um, there is multiple imaging uh, or modalities like uh, Transthoracic echo, uh, CT, or MRI. The transthoracic echo is the first line imaging. It is simple, co effective, and non invasive, and it provides both imaging and, uh, and functional or hemodynamic data. The CT and MRI should be considered in uh, some situation 
uh, like an acute or recurrent pericarditis, if there is inconclusive uh, transthoracic uh, echo imaging, failed the response to NSA therapy, there is atypical presentation, there is concern for card, uh, constrictive pericarditis, or there is associated MI or a new plasm. For constrictive pericarditis, uh, there is also inconclusive uh, transthoracic echo imaging, uh, and when pericardial thickness or tissue assessment is necessary. And pericardial masses to fully uh, characterize the tissue, uh, to assess for metastasis, and to evaluate for pericardial diverticulum or cyst. And for the congenital absence of the pericardium, when the pericardium uh, morphology must be assessed before the OR. Uh, this table uh, demonstrates the, the, uh, the different imaging modalities in various, uh, in the findings, different imaging modalities in various uh, pericardial disease. You can uh, review it later. So we, uh, I will start with the last objective, which is the, uh, some of the operations in, for the pericardial disease. Uh, we will start with the mediastinal re-exploration. Uh, as we said, that post-op hemorrhage complicates approximately 3 to 5% of cardiac operations, which is uh, this risk is nearly doubles in the setting of free operation or valve surgery. And the typical scenario, uh, especially in the, in the ICU patients, is declining chest tubes uh, output after a period of early post-op bleeding, tachycardia, uh, narrowed uh, pulse pressure, increased the right-sided filling pressure, the patient will be oliguric, acidotic, there is escalation of the enotropes or vasopressor, and there is decreased cardiac index. The echo here is not routinely helpful because of the poor window uh, immediately post-op. Uh, but there is sometimes subtle echo findings, like an inspiratory increase in the right ventricular and diastolic diameter and reciprocal decrease in the left side as well as increase in the early uh, peak tricuspid flow velocity and reduction of the mitral, uh, uh, across the mitral valve and in inspiration. And the, in, there is, uh, if the patient, uh, if there is a coagulopathy, it is important to correct the coagulopathy, the hypothermia, the acidosis, and the hypovolemia. Uh, so during the exploration, the first priority is to relieve the tamponade by evacuating retained mediastinal blood and controlling the life-threatening hemorrhage. Um, and sometimes uh, the dramatic hemodynamic improvement will frequently observed upon chest reopening. The mediastinal uh, re-exploration is done, uh, can be undertaken in a through and methodical manner with a careful attention paid to all suture lines. So we should uh, evaluate the, uh, the whole mediastinum uh, and uh, even if the culprit source is thought to be identified. So inspection will be from top, top down while simultaneously obtaining a hemiostasis. And uh, then finally, we can uh, do copious warm saline irrigation and uh, goes backing, uh, which is a helpful adjunct. The second one is the pericardiosynthesis. Is, uh, this one is usually performed under fluoroscopic, sonographic, or CT guidance. Uh, sometimes there will be arterial and right heart catheterization uh, for hemodynamic monitoring. So um, the, the steps of the procedure is that after administration of 1% uh, lidocaine to the skin and soft tissues of the left uh, ZV costal area, a 25 milli uh, ml uh, syringe is affixed to a three-way stopcock and then to an 18 gauge spinal needle. Then this, uh, this needle is connected to the ECG lead and under uh, ECG and imaging guide guidance, the needle is advanced from the left uh, of the sub zivoidal area, aiming toward the left shoulder, as you see in this picture. Then uh, the pericardial space, once the pericardial space is entered, uh, the guide wire is introduced, the needle is removed and the catheter is inserted over the guide wire. Then the pericardial uh, fluid uh, can be drained. And usually the symptoms re will be relieved uh, immediately. Uh, and if the blood is drawn, uh, uh, you should take 5 ml and place it uh, over a sponge to see if it's clot. Because the clotting of the blood will suggest that the needle has either 
uh, enter the cardiac chamber or cause epicardial injury. And the pericardial space is drained every eight hours. Then uh, the catheter can be removed within 24 to 72 hours. Pneumothorax is a potential complication, so chest X-ray is mandatory post-procedure. The third one the, is pericardial window, and the purpose of uh, partial pericardial resection or window is to drain fluid into the pleural or peritoneal compartment to prevent a reaccumulation. Uh, the procedure can be performed via thoracoscopy, anterior thoracot uh, thoracotomy, or subzevoidal incision. And when the pericardium is incised, the fluid will be uh, invariably drained under pressure, and the excised portion of the pericardium should, uh, should be as large as visible to prevent recurrence. Uh, I have here a video for this one. This is via the sub-zevoidal sub uh, uh, window. Uh, so this uh, the here, uh, there, there is a marking, uh, the marking of the incision. Then a uh, short, uh, short uh, vertical incision about five to eight centimeter long is made over the zeepoid, extended into the midline of the abdomen, um, and the linea alba is incised. Then we can see after that, we should incise uh, or we should completely remove the zeepoid. Then the retrosternal space is entered by means of finger dissection. Dissection of any adhesions or something. This is also his dissecting. Then the pericardium is grasped with a hook um, and is incised. And, and the opening of the pericardium is uh, enlarged by sharp inc incising the pericardium. Then the sucker is, uh, entered, is inserted into the pericardial space and the fluid is drained. Mm. Then through a separate incision, uh, uh, he can, the tube is inserted into the pericardial space and connected to the drain, and the incision will be closed uh, via layers. Okay, uh, the last one is the, uh, not the last one, the, uh, the, the one before the last one is the pericardiectomy. Uh, chronic pericardial constriction is treated by pericardial excision. Uh, because dense adhesions and calcification which can penetrate into the pericard myocardium, the pericardial resection can be technically challenging, and the procedure is usually done via median sternotomy with capability to use a cardiopulmonary bypass as needed. Um, I read that some surgeons will prefer the counter uh, provided by the filled heart, which facilitate the pericardial stripping. And also some surgeons, they are doing the pericardiectomy through the left anterior thoracotomy. So it is a surgeon preference. So the objective of this procedure is to release the ventricles from the densely adherent pericardial shear. And, uh, and this can be done by excising all the anterior pericardium between phrenic nerves and the posterior pericardium around its reflection on the vena cava and the pulmonary veins. However, in some cases, a complete pericardial resection is not visible in all cases, especially uh, in cases of radiation-induced disease. Uh, so leaving densely adherent scar, particularly over the vena cava and the atria, may be uh, more safer. And although the surgery alleviates or improves the symptoms in most patients, long-term survival is diminished in patients who have had prior uh, heart surgery uh, particularly in patients with radiation-induced uh, constrictive pericarditis in home, they have also restricted cardiomyopathy. The last one is the waffle procedure. 
this is a new. Uh, this is uh, I did not see it at all. The, it is only in the box. Um, if uh, if conventional pericarditomy pericarditomy uh, not improving the cardiac function um, and does not result in a prompt hemodynamic improvement intraop, then a waffle procedure can be performed. Uh, this involves the creation of inter. This involved creation of intersecting longitudinal and transverse incisions through the epicardium across the entire surface of the ventricles, resulting in small islands of pericardial scar tissue around one uh, centimeter square in size, like in the picture here. Uh, so this incision will relieve the constriction and enables the proper ventricular dilatation or filling. And the results of this procedure have been encouraging, although published data are relatively limited for this procedure. So as a summary, uh, tamponade occurs when intrapericardial pressure impedes the cardiac filling, causing an increase in venous pressure, decrease the cardiac output, and the progression to shock and death if left untreated. Constrictive pericarditis is characterized by prominent wide descent, square root sign, septal bounce, and exacerbation exaggerated respiratory variation in the left and the right-sided flow, and it is best treated via uh, pericardiectomy. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is differentiated, should be differentiated from pericardial constriction by the presence of pulmonary hypertension, by atrial enlargement and ventricular thickening, and this uh, condition is not treated surgically. Uh, acute pericarditis is often self-limited and responds to NSAIDs and calcium. Uh, this is my references, and thank you. If you have any questions, thank you, Anwar, for this presentation. I believe Dr. Fayyad has something to share with us. So, if you can, Anwar, and share your slide. Okay. So, Dr. Fayyad can share his. Uh, thanks, Dr. Anwar, uh, for this uh, extensive presentation. It was uh, uh, very informative. I just want to uh, share uh, 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 the pericardial reflection slide, uh, if I may. Uh, can, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just want to point out some practical uh, uh, implications of this. Uh, the, the oblique sinus mark here is not actually the oblique sinus. Oblique sinus comes between the IVC and the uh, right uh, inferior pulmonary vein. So this can be uh, variable in size. So one of the practical things is that when we cannulate the IVC routinely and when we want to snare the IVC, we make a small nick in the pericardial reflection here. So uh, what actually we are cutting there is the uh, reflection of the pericardium from the parieta, parietal to the visceral side. Uh, so this is one. Uh, and the other thing is here, uh, I want to point out that this uh, base of the left atrium uh, is actually not covered by the pericardium. You can consider it actually an extra pericardial structure. So when you lift the heart, uh, what you see the reflection of the pericardium or when the attachment of the heart to the left atrium uh, is actually where the pericardial reflection is. So especially in transplants, when you explant the heart, when you cut out the heart, uh, you leave a, a margin of the left atrial wall, uh, which is actually extra pericardial. And then you sew it back, uh, sew the new heart back, uh, starting from the left atrium. So I just want to point out that. And here again, in the transverse sinus, 
uh, the pericardial reflection is uh, from the parietal pleura onto the SVC. And uh, again, when you want to snare the SVC, you pass a right angle or a certain ski around uh, behind the uh, uh, SVC and you cut the reflection of the pericardium to go around the SVC. So this is about the reflection of the pericardium in routine uh, cases uh, of any surgery requiring snaring of the SVC and IVC. Uh, if there are any other questions, I'll take them. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. This is my first time, but I'm really glad to be associated with the Saudi board. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fayyad, and thank you very much for joining us. And hopefully, we'll see you more, inshallah, in the next lectures. Inshallah. So, anyone has a question for Dr. Fayyad or Dr. Anwar? Okay. So I believe we don't have enough time to proceed with the second lecture as we have uh, Dr. Bakin's lecture at 2.30. So we will either make it as a last lecture or if we don't have time for today, we'll, we'll postpone to the next activity. So we'll meet you back at 2.30 with Dr. Faisal Bakin lecture. All right, sure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
one last week, and so we're going to do another one. Good morning. Sabah al khair. Good morning. Sabah al nur. Ahlan nikto. Sameen, you shall feel him near? Naam, Sameen. Shall I feel him? Sameen. Tayyib. Mumtaz. Habit Shakarkum, I'm looking forward to this opportunity. Um, I'm here to uh, mostly get to know you and um, discuss ideas. Um, I have some slides that um, I could share with you because I understand that you wanted me to present something um, about cabbage, but um, feel free to decide on how you want to spend the time. I do have a patient on the table, um, so if I get called urgently or emergency, I apologize ahead of time. Sure, uh, it's okay. But uh, hopefully, um, I, I plan to spend as much time with you as I can. We hope so as well. Um, just by way of introduction, um, I, I'm, I'm a staff surgeon at the uh, Cleveland Clinic and the um, Sheikh Hamdan bin Rashid Al Maktoub, uh, distinguished chair in uh, thoracic and cardiovascular surgery. And my main interest is um, coronary artery bypass grafting, um, multi arterial grafting, uh, reoperations, and um, minimally invasive valve surgery. Uh, but I'm the director of uh, coronary vascularization at the clinic and also the director of quality at the uh, department. So that's by way of uh, background. Before the clinic, I was in Houston um, at Texas Heart and the VA, and I did my um, general surgery training at Mayo Clinic and did my medical school um, in the UK at Cambridge University. So that's, that's my background. I'm gonna stop here and let you guys uh, speak um, and, 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 and take it from there. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bakin, for joining us today. Uh, we are really glad to have you uh, and uh, to spare some time for your busy schedule. Uh, I'm not sure if you, if you want to start now or you would like to wait until uh, 7.30. It's up to you. We, we can start if you have enough people and, and uh, if that's okay with you. Uh, but I also like to hear a little bit about you and your um, group. Um. Yeah, we are we, we are a group of uh, cardiac surgery residents from all over uh, Kingdom Saudi Arabia. We have around you know, forty something residents uh, from all the different levels. So our program is a seven years program. Uh -huh. uh, you'll do it immediately after medical school. You don't have to do a general surgery uh, residency. So it's like a uh, combined program for, for, for cardiac surgery. Uh, so we, we have this meeting on a weekly basis every Thursday. Uh, usually the, the residents are the one who, who present uh, the lectures. We have some um, staff like a consultant surgeons presenting from one, one time to another. Um, so most of them, we have different levels like from junior residents to up to graduating residents. So from different levels of, of, and different uh, hospitals as well. So we have from Riyadh, Jeddah, uh, Eastern Province, Dammam, and so on. Um, that's great. So, so let's see, how many people uh, do we have and how many people are you expecting? We have 33. Yeah, we have, yeah, we have 33. I believe we can start now. We, we were expecting around 40 to 50. So we can... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Use the time with uh, with you and start. It's okay with us. So, is is can everybody um, um, unmute and ask questions anytime they want, or do you control it? How does it work? No, it's 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 free. They can unmute anytime they want. Yeah. So yeah, so feel free to uh, to interrupt or ask questions, or if you want me to go back um, or discuss things that are not on my slides. That's fine too. 
Um, there are certain things that I will dwell on and there's certain things that we can go through quickly. Um, hopefully we'll leave some time at the end as well um, to um, discuss. Um, maybe we could go through the presentation within half an hour and then leave 15 minutes to maybe half an hour um, for questions and free discussion. Uh, the time yeah. here in Cleveland is 7.23. What time is it in Saudi? It's, it's, it's 2.23 in the afternoon. Oh, it's not, not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's a good time for us. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen. Do you guys see a slide yet or not yet? Yeah, we're starting to see. Yeah, we can see it now. You see it? Okay, good, good. So it's called Cabbage Why and How. Um, at the Cleveland Clinic, which is the largest center in North America, um, a third of the operations we do, we do between uh, 4,500 um, and 5,000 cases, a third of those involve a cabbage and about 60% um, of the cases are isolated um, cabbages. Um, the cabbage volume is actually increasing at the clinic and that's probably because um, people are realizing that there's benefit to multi-arterial grafting and they know that we do that so they refer us patients both locally, uh, regionally, nationally, and internationally. And also maybe because people realize that um, the benefit of cabbage over PCI. And um, finally, maybe cabbage is no longer that uh, glamorous and, and many cardiologists are doing the transcatheter structural stuff like TAVR and mitral stuff. So they're doing less PCI so we're seeing more uh, surgical cases. We don't know, but in any case, the number of cases have gone up. Um, it's a very safe operation, uh, despite the complexity of the cases that we get. We, we usually get the really good ones, um, the really um, healthy uh, CEOs, executives, VIPs that want multi-arterial grafting. But we also get the really sick ones that nobody else wants to do um, and the reoperations. But the mortality has been less than 1% for many years. The SDS uh, expects it to be anywhere between 1% and 2%. So it's a really safe operation. Um, if you take out the emergencies and the really high risk cases, if, if somebody walks into your clinic um, rather than being on a balloon pump in the ICU, if they walk into the clinic, um, it's a virtual, um, almost 100% uh, success rate. Um, so what are the strengths of um, our program or indeed any um, leading cabbage program? I think a leading cabbage program should have expertise in multi-arterial grafting and in complex cabbage. And what I mean by complex cabbage are patients with poor targets with multiple stents uh, or what's called metal jackets uh, redo cabbage and cabbage in low EF patients. And we will talk about many of those. Um, this is what we do at the clinic. 34% uh, are multi arterial cabbage. Well, you say, well, you just told us that this is your specialty. How come only 34% have multi arterial cabbage? Well, that's because the rest are really either sick in the ICU uh, on inotropic support, acute MI, uh, or very old, very frail. I mean, you got to select your patients. Not every patient will get multi-arterial grafting. Uh, but the default strategy is using multi-arterial grafting. Uh, metal jacket, you're all familiar. This is an LED that's basically carpeted from proximal to distal. This is the apex of the heart. This is the proximal. And there were stents all the way down to here. But those stents were not horribly uh, um, stenotic. So you could do an endotrectomy and open it up and remove all the stents, or you could go beyond the stents. And that's what we did in this case. And we put a lead tattoo LED all the way down. And that 
on the right side is the 3D reconstruction to show you that that lead is still open to the uh, apex of the heart. Redo cabbages, um, the mortality at um, nationally at like centers. And what, what I mean by like groups are Mayo, Duke, uh, Johns Hopkins, and the big academic centers, the mortality of redo cabbage is 6%. And um, the STS nationally, it's 4.2%. That doesn't mean that Mayo and the others are not good. It just means that they're probably getting risk riskier cases. We've been lucky at the clinic. We've had zero mortality actually for the last um, four years. And we're actually using multi-arterial grafting even for redo cabbage situations. And we're studying that now and we'll publish it in the near future. What about poor EF? If a patient comes in with a really low ejection fraction, sometimes we do an impella-assisted cabbage, whereby we support the heart perioperatively. And if the heart recovers, uh, we remove the impella. If the heart doesn't recover, then we consider uh, long-term mechanical support or transplantation. And what about minimally invasive cabbage? Well, we believe that if the uh, LAD is the main vessel that's involved, then it's worthwhile um, doing a, an off-pump mid-cab. Um, I think it's safe to do it. Um, if you select your patients, it should be a fun operation. And I put a hybrid room beside it because if there was a right um, coronary lesion that's not critical, or other lesions in smaller vessels, then the cardiologist can stent them. Um, but if they have critical disease in multi-vessel, then we're honest with the patient and say, hey, you need multi-arterial grafting because you're more interested in the long-term stuff. Uh, but the minimally invasive stuff does have a role for cosmesis, um, less transfusion, less insult to the body. And in certain patients, for example, on steroids or immunosuppression, Avoiding sternotomy and potential complications of a sternotomy is a good idea. So this is how the patient would look like. They typically go home day three after the mid-cab. Um, we measure flow in the OR as a quality uh, measure because you don't want to leave the OR with a graft that's down. And we typically for the mid-cabs get a CTA uh, before they leave the hospital to make sure that that anastomosis is perfect. Because again, nobody should leave the hospital with graft down. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of cabbage. Uh, cabbage, there's, there are many claims to who did the first cabbage, but really the um, popularization of cabbage uh, or the team that really made it a standard of care and proved its safety and efficacy. Uh, Dr. Favoloro, who's a surgeon from Argentina who came to the clinic for a while, and Dr. Mason Sons, who's a cardiologist, who's the father of coronary angiography. So they got together, followed their patients, and published um, the first 300 patients in JAMA and proved to the world that cabbage indeed is a safe and effective strategy. And we wrote this editorial um, celebrating the 50th anniversary of cabbage. Um, so, so cabbage survived and endured over 50 years and will, it will probably endure many more years to come because of the superiority of cabbage over other therapies that we know right now. I'm not gonna spend much time on this slide, but it, it's a comparison between um, PCI versus optimal medical therapy or cabbage versus optimal medical therapy. And even though there, are, there is not a single study that shows the superiority of PCI over optimal medical management, there are many studies that show the superiority of cabbage in that setting. PCI is good when you have an MI in the acute setting, but in the setting of stable coronary artery disease, in the setting of stable angina, um, carriage, uh, FAME2, BARRY2, Orbita, and uh, more recently, the ischemia study showed no benefit of PCI. Um, with regards to cabbage, we know from multiple studies that cabbage offers a survival advantage. And this is the ischemia study. Um, the ischemia study did not differentiate between PCI and cabbage and only the minority of patients received cabbage. So you can't really draw conclusions about the role of cabbage. 
Um, but suffice it to say that again, um, in a stable situation, um, especially in patients with a heavy atherosclerotic burden, cabbage seems to be superior to PCI and is definitely superior to um, optim optimal medical management. So let's look at it, um, cabbage versus PCI now for all types of patients. Um, and when you do that, you usually look at meta-analysis and this one pulled 23 randomized trials. And um, it is no surprise that PCI was associated with a significantly higher rate of cardiac and non-cardiac mortality. In other words, cabbage improved survival. What about in diabetics? Um, this study is the long-term follow-up of the FREEDOM trial, uh, which clearly shows the superiority of cabbage over PCI in terms of survival. So when patients have cabbage, it's, it's important to emphasize that cabbage is safe as a, as a therapy uh, in terms of short-term outcomes with a mortality of less than 1%. But, you know, when they say, hey, I want to get better quicker, I want to get a stent, you got to remind them that uh, modern day cabbage, you're out of the hospital in three to four days. And this is a lifetime warranty uh, with regards to PCI. It's not a lifetime warranty. And um, again, this is another example showing the superiority of um, cabbage at the population level in Canada over PCI. What about left main disease? This is a little bit more controversial. You all probably heard about the Excel trial whereby the composite outcome was not different, but many surgeons believe that this was rigged. And one of the surgeons, Dr. Taggart, withdrew from the authorship because he believed that they used MI definitions that favored uh, PCI, and therefore the composite outcome was not different. But if you look at the death rate, there was a 30% difference in mortality rate between uh, PCI and CABIT4 left main disease. The absolute difference is 3%, but the relative difference is 30%. And if you use the uh, international definitions, universal definitions of MI, then actually cabbage um, is clearly the superior therapy in MI and the composite outcome. So really for the left main disease, cabbage seems to be the winner again over PCI. And this is a cardiologist statistician from England, his name is James Brophy, that looked at um, multiple trials, Syntax, Noble, Precombat, and Excel, and demonstrated that there's an 85 to 99% probability that PCI is associated with increased all-cause mortality in patients with left main disease. Well, what better statistics would you ask for? So in other words, we can be almost certain that cabbage is better than PCI, even in left main disease. What about in patients with low EF? Uh, this nice study by uh, Mark Ruel, uh, who is a senior author, demonstrated that cabbage is superior to PCI in patients with low EF, and this is at the population level in Canada. If we look at it three ways, um, in patients with low EF, between cabbage, medical therapy, and PCI, this meta-analysis um, uh, shows that the cabbage is the winner, even in patients with low EF when compared to PCI and medical management. What about age cutoff? If you look at this um, subgroup analysis of the STITCH trial, even in patients who are over 70 or over 80, cabbage seems to have a persistent advantage. So as we mentioned before, you can have stents and keep re-stenting because you keep having recurrent symptoms, assuming that you survive those episodes, or you can have a durable solution with a cabbage. So why is cabbage um, superior to PCI? Well, it's all to do with the anatomy and physiology. This nice study from Boston shows that the MI location in in uh, blue, usually the culprit lesion in the vessel occurs in the first five centimeters. So they're all here, 
the blue colored bars. But when you do a bypass, you usually go beyond five centimeters. So you basically provide the field effect. <clears throat> In other words, you don't only protect them from the current culprit lesion, but you prevent them from potential future culprit lesions. And here's a guy that is now 87, diabetic, who had a cabbage almost 30 years ago. And the native circulation is, for all intents and purposes, totally gone. The right is occluded and the left main is gone. How is that patient surviving? Well, he's surviving on a single mammary to LAD that supplies the entire heart to diagonals, septals, and collaterals. So you see here on the right side, the whole heart lights up. So if this patient had received stents 30 years ago, I don't think this patient will be with us. So no matter how good the stent is, that stent only protects the few millimeters or the centimeters where it's deployed. It does not provide future protection. So that's why we're seeing that more and more cardiologists now are referring uh, patients for cabbage. What do the guidelines say? Well, the guidelines are being updated, uh, but essentially the American ones um, give a class one indication for cabbage and three vessel disease and left main, but do not give PCI class one. Class one is the highest level of, rec uh, of recommendation. So this set of um, guidelines, I think, is uh, very rational and based on solid evidence. The Europeans are a little bit uh, less convincing in their recommendation because they do give class one recommendations for PCI um, for the left mean and the three vessel, but they qualify it by using syntax scores, meaning that the higher syntax score should probably get a cabbage. Uh, but in reality, most patients who present with left mean disease or three vessel disease have syntax scores that are high. So in essence, um, the recommendations would, if, if they're interpreted, if they're followed, then most patients with left mean and three vessel in Europe uh, would be recommended to have cabbage. But how can we increase the advantage of cabbage? Well, we've seen that the ITA to the LAD is durable and it's the standard of care. Uh, but Dr. Lytle here from the clinic demonstrated that if you use two ITAs, then there's an incremental survival advantage, but that kicks in after year eight. You gotta wait to see a difference. And the longer you wait, the greater the survival advantage. So at the clinic, we've been using um, ITAs for over 20 years now bilaterally. And if you look at Dr. David Taggart's art study, even though it was a negative study um, with no survival difference, between um, beta and a single mammary to the LAD, if you look as, at the as treated analysis and adjust for um, the use of radial artery, which is superior as we will discuss to vein, um, if you adjust for that, then those patients who get multi arterial grafting have a better survival rate than those who get a single lead to LAD. So, just to recap, who gets multi-arterial grafting? You gotta look at physiologic considerations. So if it's a young, robust patient, they should get um, multi-arterial grafting. And then you could look at the anatomic considerations. What do I mean by anatomic considerations? And this is a paper that I published in Jack. Um, and you gotta choose a big target for your second arterial graft. So if you just use it to show off and use the second mammary to bypass a small diagonal or a small right or a small PDA, you're not gonna make a survival difference in the patient. But if you use it to bypass an important vessel, and what, what I defined as important vessel is a vessel that reaches 75% and more towards the apex of the heart, then you will make a survival advantage. So really it's a dose response relationship between um, the amount of myocardium supplied by the arterial grafts and the survival. 
So if you look at this calf picture here, those OMs are important. They're reaching the apex of the heart. So this patient will get a Lita to the LAD and will get a Rita to the OM here because that's an important OM. So that's the dose response relationship. And when do you saturate this dose response relationship? Is when you hit all the important targets. So if there are three important targets, you gotta hit them with RTL graphs. If there are two, then you do two. And there's different ways to do your multi-RTL grafting. Uh, you could use inside you double inflow memories. Um, I do like this configuration if the lesion is proximal on the circumflex because you could direct the Rita behind the aorta. I don't like to bring it in front of the aorta because we do lots of redos. And if it's a patient with a shallow chest, then you could, this mammary will be stuck against the sternum. Uh, you can try and cover it with fat, but that's not a pleasant scenario. So if you could put it behind the aorta, that'll be great. Or you could take it as a composite um, graft and supplement it with a radial, supplement it with a vein. Sometimes you find that the mammaries are too small or the radial is crunchy and calcified. There's no harm in using a good quality vein. So people ask me, when do you use two inflows versus you know, a, uh, a single inflow? Well, if you use them in situ, the way I mentioned, um, it's, you're having two inflows, so that's physiologic. You know, we're created with a left and a right system, so having two systems is redundant and good. Um, but the cons is that you have a limited reach. You can't reach to all the targets that you need, and then reoperations crossing the midline can be an issue. While when you do a composite graft and you base everything on a liter to LED, you put your, all your eggs in one basket, even though you maximize the reach of the construct. Uh, so you got to be careful. And this is an example of a composite. It has to be absolutely perfect and we construct our composite even before we go on bypass and make sure that there's excellent flow through both arms. Sizing is a little tricky, especially when you're on pump because the heart is decompressed. And I don't recommend this construct for a beginner, but at some point you will find it useful to reach multiple targets uh, around the heart. And this is um, a demonstration of how that composite looks. I told you that we do CTAs on uh, many patients uh, before they leave the hospital to make sure that the graphs are patent. And here is the composite. Uh, one limb of it will um, go to the LAD and one limb will go to the CERC. So quality control is important um, in, in that regard. But there's no difference in graft patency if you're careful between an insight or a T graft. And this is a study by Glenor, a randomized trial that showed that the patency is excellent for the Lita and Rita, whether you use them in situ or as a Y graft. But you gotta worry about competitive flow and balanced flow issues. What I mean by competitive flow is when the lesion in the native coronary is not severe, then the patency of the uh, arterial graft um, will be diminished. And that's particularly true for the radial. We don't recommend using radials for lesions less than 70% on the left system and 90% for the RCA. But for the Rita and the Lita, there's no inflection point. It's just the more severe the stenosis, the better the patency. And the imbalance flow is when lesions in, if you take a composite and the lesions are not that severely stenosed specifically for the inferior lateral wall, if you do multiple sequential bypasses, those last segments of the Rita will not stay open because of competitive flow and, and, and you better be careful. So I only use this construct to reach the um, PDA if the PDA is totally occluded. Otherwise, that last limb will go down. And um, we, we looked at how the composites um, patency uh, pan out at the clinic and the patency rate for the composite graft is slightly lower than sequential. Um, 
but not that much low. It's only 15% down at 10 to 15 years. That's way better than a vein graft. This is also another study that shows the importance of competitive flow and balance flow from Japan. I'm not going to spend time on it. This is kind of too involved. But again, um, that last segment uh, should be severely narrowed, um, the, the target vessels. Otherwise, that last segment will go down. And we talked about the radial grafts, that they're better than um, cephalus vein grafts. Um, and, and they could demonstrate that for patency and for graft failure, failure, but for the composite outcome at five years, there's no difference. There was a follow-up paper at JAMA that showed the difference, but I don't think it was a robust paper. So for all intents and purposes, we encourage maximizing the use of arterial grafts. This is a patient um, who had the T graft that I showed you before. This is a patient that had, um, this is the RETA, so an end-to-end -to, -end to a radial that we took off the aorta. And I think I have a video to show you. This is the uh, radial on the left side and here's the uh, reta on the right side. You spatulate them, then you use 8O to create a single long graft that you could use to go around the heart. This is the PDA, which was occluded. Remember I told you this last segment has to be severely narrow. So you do end to end for the PDA So we're completing the end-to-end -to, -end to the PDA here. And then we go side to side to one of the OMs. I put it in fast motion, even though we saw as fast as this, but uh, I'm trying to show you how we construct this. So that's the first side to side. That's the second side to side. So this is the third bypass. And then this is the radial that we're showing to a thin aorta. So, so this is what you get. You get the whole inferior lateral wall supplied by a tear graft. Then you put a liter to LAD. So this, this patient, uh, will will probably never ever require a redo uh, operation, and then we we'll look at the, the flow. Um, always quality control is key. So, what about cabbage in low EF and heart failure? Um, they're higher risk patients, and they're more likely to get postcardiogram shock and have higher morbidity and mortality. And this just came out in press. I I chaired the expert consensus document of the AATS on those sick patients. And um, we know from the STITCH trial that cabbage is superior to optimal medical therapy in patients with low EF and coronary artery disease, both in terms of um, cardiac cause mortality and all cause mortality. Um, I wanna show you a case of a guy with a low EF um, he's 47, uh, he's got diabetes, he's got ischemic cardiomyopathy and congestive heart failure. And you can see how diffuse and um, how extensive his coronary uh, disease is. I mean, there's no stenting option for this guy and he's a young guy. And he's got targets. So some people will say refer somebody with a low EF like that. I think his EF was 15%. Refer him for transplant. Well, this guy, uh, that's his EF, 15%. And he's also got moderate RV dysfunction. Well, we'd like to give those people like him a chance because having a transplant or a mechanical assist device is not an easy undertaking. It's a very expensive, but more importantly, it has a tremendous burden on the patient and their families. So what would you guys do? Cabbage, PCI, optimal medical therapy, or LVAD? I don't know if we can vote on this platform. We probably can't vote. But does anybody 
let's put it this way. Does anyone disagree with a cabbage? Unmute yourself and give a reason. So you all agree with cabbage. Do I do you agree with the cabbage? Well, I personally I would disagree, maybe because of his very low EF. I'm not sure how 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 it would recover after the cabbage. Okay, well I'm glad you're honest and and I thought I thought along the same lines. Well, can we see that the short, uh, you know, image of the echo? Did you do viability for this guy before going for surgery? Yeah, good questions. We'll answer all those questions. But uh, these are all the images that I uploaded. I'm sorry I don't have everything there. But here, you can have another look at it. Maybe it's got something saved anteriorly. Well, here are the things, and you guys touched a little bit upon them. Um, when people come to you, first of all, I think the most important thing is, did this patient come to clinic and see me and said, hey, I'm just a little bit short of breath when I, uh, <laughs> when I do my gardening or when I go up the third or fourth level of stairs. No, there, is of another, uh, there is another option, uh, which is uh, maybe a Lima to LED beating heart and then uh, and then leave the rest for the cardiologist if they can, and which can be even, uh, uh, you know, less uh, heavy for the patient. But definitely with if, uh, if there's anything left, uh, you may give a chance in such a young patient, I'm sure. And, and sorry, who, 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 who am I talking to? I'm uh, Dr. Uh, Claudio. I'm very glad to talk to you. I mean, exchanging opinion with you because uh, you got somebody, uh, you cited a number of times, uh, my good friend Mario, and uh, he is now a friend. I used to be, I mentored him back in Italy uh, a few years ago. So you're, uh, obviously, you're obviously not a resident. Are you an attending there? <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, Mario was my resident. Let's, let's say. Yeah, that. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, uh, and the the these things uh, to we do these things at Prince Sultan, uh, not as many as you probably, but uh, in selected patient definitely yes. Uh, the the guys here saw some of them uh, now are uh, you know um, uh, listening. The some. Some of them uh, uh, saw the, the anastomosis of a radial to a, a, a Rita. Um, uh, some of them saw uh, bilateral. We do this in selected patient because, of course, uh, you know, you have to select your patient for, uh, for uh, uh, you know, full arterial vascularization. So that's, uh, that's the point. Uh, the, the, the very important thing is that did you uh, you have to do as many as you can, but uh, not all the patients are uh, for uh, arterial revascularization. Therefore, so, sure. so Cla a... Claudia, at which hospital do you practice at? Prince Sultan Cardiac Center. We are. Prince Sultan? Yeah. I didn't catch your last name, Claudio. Oh, it's very complicated. Pragliola. P R A G L I O L A. That's, that's an easy Italian name. Uh, yeah, really? Okay. Pragiola. Okay, great. Well, th thanks. I like lively discussions. You know, I, I don't think there's right or wrong answer uh, to any... No, no, no. Definitely yeah. not at all. I, I do agree yeah. with you. I mean, that's very, was very interesting. And what we would have done here, I would have, uh, you know, look for viability and if anything was viable, uh, probably. And for the brief, uh, you do the few moments I could uh, have a look to the probably the the the, the circumflex and the OM and this guy could could have been standard mm -hmm. and maybe a Lima to LAD beating heart with a balloon or some sort of assistant. Yeah, uh, could have been a very a sort of quick surgery with uh, you know less heavy for the patient and give him a chance. That for sure. Uh, yeah, no, but these are these are excellent points. Any other attendings on the call? Any other staff? Uh, not from Prince Sultan, I think. 
Faisal, uh, this is Farid, Farid Kogir from King Faisal. Hi, Farid. Uh, I am uh, having to talk to you a few years back uh, through Dr. Maddox. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I knew that <laughs> name was familiar. <laughs> Well, it's good to have you. It's a pleasure and actually honor. And I hope those residents will realize uh, how fortunate they are to have you talking to them about well, this topic. Thank uh, you very much for coming. I have a mandatory question. Which Thank you for it. Leonastic to you. How do you harvest your memories? I, I don't harvest them. My, my trainees, my residents how harvest How your trainees try <laughs> to harvest your memories? No, actually, I do harvest my own memory for the mid calves because obviously um, okay. we, we, we don't but have the. Do you volume. harvest the pedicle or skeletonized? Yeah, so, so you ask a very important question, and I've written an editorial about it. Um, we harvest them skeletonized. Can you repeat, the, please? We harvest them skeletonized. C can you repeat, please? This is the hardest thing to make people understanding. And if you want them back for more than surgery, you have to ask, uh, harvest your mammary skeleton eyes. Yeah. And this is that there are a couple of people here and even more, they are excellent, but it was very hard. I mean, to make people understanding, they have to harvest mammary skeleton eyes. So repeat again, please. <laughs> so, yes, so we, we harvest them skeletonized, but if it's stuck to the chest wall in certain locations, if there's scarring, yeah. then you could take a thin um, area around it to avoid injury to the vessel. So I think if you give me slight pedicle with a healthy mammary, I prefer that to a skeletonized mammary. I tell my residents, I want a mammary that looks like a white noodle and not like a pink or purple sausage. Okay, that's fine. Because when it's all Fair beaten enough. up, it's 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 a problem, and and I got a full talk about memories that are been uh, that are beaten up, and I got lots of pictures and videos and how to deal with them, because we, what I do is I cut the injured segment out and I splice what I have remaining. Um, there's creative ways to deal with injured memories, but that's a topic yeah, for yeah. another talk. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. I agree so, yeah. so uh, Farid, are you still in touch with Dr. Maddox? We, we almost, almost all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's a great guy. He, he actually visited me uh, not too long ago, and uh, we went together to Jordan. It was uh, lots of fun. He speaks oh, highly yeah. of you, by the way. Huh? Yeah, well, uh, he's a great guy. Yeah. So, so let, us know, let us know when you're uh, back in the U.S., and uh, we'd love to get together, maybe for the Debeki meeting. Yeah, definitely. Thank Inshallah. you. Okay, so um, in the interest of time, any other questions, I will continue otherwise. I have another question for you. This is very important here. We have a large population of diabetic patients. Many of our patients are diabetic. Um, so what are your precautions uh, uh, if you go for a double mammary in a diabetic patient? Do you tend to exclude them? Um, do you tend to do some of them? And if yes, if you exclude why and who, and uh, if you, you know, if you do, when? Yeah, Claudia, you bring up important points. Um, many people from your part of the world, we get lots of people that come from uh, the Middle East to the clinic. And they are almost always fragile diabetics with an A1C, 9, 10, 11, 12, I've seen 16. That's yeah. one yes, problem. Me too. <laughs> Even and, 20. <laughs> and, and they have uh, peripheral vascular disease and they're smokers and their targets are suboptimal. So in those cases, it's not a problem if you do not do multi arterial grafting. Um, because if you try to use the radial in somebody with an A1C of 16, and you don't want them to get mediastinitis when they're traveling back to Jordan or Qatar or Syria, um, day seven or day 10. I mean, the last thing you want is mediastinitis. So in those cases, we'll look for a radial. And if the radial is not suitable because of their peripheral vascular disease and smoking, then we do vein mapping on everybody and we use the best segment of vein. But 
Having said that, again, the default strategy for anybody that walks into my office is multi-arterial grafting. And if I'm really worried about medial stenitis, I use the radial. If I don't find a suitable radial, I might go back and do bilateral mammary with strict skeletonization and strict glucose control. They all are on an insulin drip. And even before we do the surgery, if we have the luxury of time, we have the endocrine service see them and get the glucose to be consistently less than 200 before the surgery. Mm -hmm. So, so we, have, we have things we do and we're very aggressive. And luckily, luckily, we, we, we have seen very little um, external complications, very little. Um, if I tell you zero, you won't believe me. Uh, so I'm going to just tell you very little. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely possible if you are very cautious, so you prepare, your, you have the time to prepare your patient. Um, uh, we, we, sometimes we start insulin infusion uh, to control and they have everything uh, smoothly done. Um, but which percentage of diabetic patient, meaning you have a diabetic patient with good target and you understand he might benefit from arterial revascularization. He has also all the, you know, um, uh, the, the features like a, a good uh, ramus uh, or a good marginal with a proximal stenosis. You can put your rim read down the, uh, you know, uh, retroartic, uh, and the guy is diabetic. Are you going for that or not? Well, again, it depends on how bad is the diabetes um, and how old is the patient. I mean, if the patient is 80 and he's diabetic. No, 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 yeah. no. no. I, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that. You get somebody who is 50 and, uh, you know, he's in his 50s, he's a heavy smoker, uh, is diabetic, is, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would not say poorly controlled, but uh, this guy can take some liberalities, but, uh, you know, you, you know, you can control with a reasonable amount of insulin. And are you going for this guy or not? Because we see this every day. Yeah. And sometimes uh, we go, and sometimes we, we go for radial. Uh, that's yeah. it. I think, I think we have a similar uh, practice like you because okay. if, if the radial is poor in that guy, then we will use the right. But remember, if you use the right as a composite, and I use that sometimes, you don't have to harvest the whole length of it. All you need is really um, less than a METS. Um, sometimes if you're going to Ramus, you just need a few centimeters of the Rita to create... Um, you go for Y? I, I use a T more than a Y. Yeah, I go for a yeah, T. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in these cases, you would uh, take uh, the, you will leave the first and the last, uh, uh, you know, uh, intercostal and take the intermediate piece and go for a T. Uh, good idea. Yes, that, that's that's what I usually do. I, I actually did that yesterday on a 70-year-old guy. Um, I used the T and I sequential the liter to... Um, diagonal and LAD. So one thing, I don't have it on the slides, one thing that I've started using more routinely, um, you would think that with experience you do less studying, but I found the opposite. I actually do a vein map, a radial mapping, and a mammary mapping for every, almost every patient that I do. I yeah. go to the OR knowing exactly what size of mammaries I have, what size of radials I have and the quality of the vein. So yesterday's case, the, our, echo, our echo guys are excellent, our ultrasound guys. They told me that the mammary is three millimeters on both sides. And, and I knew I could do a composite because the mammary was as big as a radial or as big as a vein. And it was a very technically easy operation. On the other hand, if yesterday's case, they tell me the mammary is 1.2 millimeters then I know ahead of time that this is not going to be a composite. This is probably going to be a liter to LAD, and then I should go for a radial. Um, mm. And, 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 and it, it saves you so much time. You go into the OR knowing exactly what to expect. Now, it adds expense. It adds a few hundred dollars to do all those scans. But when you do them in bulk, you get a system and you get the... Um, economies of scale. So the actual cost is not that much, but um, something to consider. 
you know, we had to, I was just pushing most of the times uh, uh, I am uh, pushing for knowing in advance uh, how the vein is, uh, because sometimes, you know, um, you don't want uh, the people go chasing for a piece of vein and open the legs and then no, 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 no. So yeah. this is something that uh, we, we are planning here um, just to avoid, uh, you know, because uh, then you can have a substantial uh, kind of morbidities if you don't yeah. go straight yeah. in vein. And uh, not for the mammary, we don't do that, you know, it's, uh, yeah. but uh, we are doing that for, uh, for the, uh, for the veins, for sure. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. fine. But just uh, all the guys, I mean, uh, if you have any questions, uh, because I think they, mo most of them may have some, they see coronary artery bypass graft every day. And they assist uh, CABG every day, so they may have uh, questions. So what what I will do is quickly go to the remaining slides and then open it for questions. Um, how to handle a situation with low EF? I think, in my opinion, the coronary target quality is key. If the poor targets um, is the situation, then I would move away from doing a cabbage. But this guy had um, acceptable targets. Then we do, like Claude, you said, a myocardial ischemia and viability testing. Um, I know that the STITCH trial did not show a difference in outcomes. Um, so it didn't really impact the prognostic, um, immediate prognostic um, features, but those who did not have viability in the long term did poorly. Um, and then we assess how well compensated or decompensated they are. So if they, have the, if they have good targets and they walk into the clinic, um, then I would offer a cabbage. If they're in the hospital on a balloon pump, short of breath, edema, liver dysfunction, poor targets, then cabbage is not the solution. So I'm just showing examples here of the targets, ischemia and viability. We prefer an MRI. And if the enhancement is um, greater than 50%, then that scar area is unlikely to come back, although there are studies now to show that this is not entirely uh, consistent in, in different practices. Uh, but what we need to emphasize here is to differentiate between what's scar and what's stunned myocardium or hibernating myocardium. So if you do an MRI and most of the heart is scar and they have heart failure and they have poor targets, then it's foolish to do cabbage, it's futile. And this is uh, what I was referring to in terms of enhancement and uh, how many segments are involved and the thickness. And we also look at the hemodynamics if the cardiac index is um, greater than two. Um, uh, we look at the size of the ventricle. We like it to be less than 6.5 in diastolic diameter. We like to see a thick ventricle rather than a thinned out scarred ventricle. And we also look at other valvular abnormalities. And this is the prognostic value of the left ventricular and diastolic diameter. Um, the more dilated, the poorer the prognosis. We look at the comorbidities. Uh, do they look like they're smiling and uh, well compensated? Or do they look on multiple drips with a balloon pump? Um, um, you look at symptoms because angina suggests viability. Um, <clears throat> And, and in terms of uh, what we do on pump, off pump, multi-arterial grafting, um, you can read the document, but I discourage multi-arterial grafting for those who are not comfortable with it. I do it uh, for patients who, have, who are young, uh, who have good targets, uh, who are in compensated heart failure, but if they're decompensated heart failure, I'll move away for, from arterial grafts. There are many reasons. Uh, because if they're going to be on high dose pressures, those arterial grafts could spasm. We certainly wouldn't use a radial graft in a setting where we're going to use uh, or anticipate the use of pressures. On pump, off pump, it depends on the level of comfort. If you are comfortable with off pump, go ahead and do it. If you're not, this is not the time to do it. Beating heart on pump, um, there's a role for that, and we explain that in the document. I'm gonna skip through that. If you do it on pump, you gotta give any grade, you gotta give retrograde, you gotta give as much cardioplegia as you want. And don't be a hero. Don't start using cardioplegia solutions that you never use or you use for minimally invasive procedures such as Del Nido. Use the cardioplegia that works for you. We use Buckberg for those situations. 
When do you do the mitral valve? This is a whole separate talk. But if you replace that valve, um, you need to preserve the subvalvular apparatus. There are also uh, procedures now to do uh, ventricular subvalvular procedures uh, to approximate the papillary muscles or to reduce the ventricle, but we're not gonna go into that. That's way beyond the scope of this talk. Uh, but if you have a, a factors that favor you doing something about the mitral valve are the presence of AFib, the presence of heart failure, and um, inability to bring back the posterior lateral wall uh, because of poor targets or because it's dyskinetic to start with. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna waste too much time or not waste, but spend too much time talking about how to optimize them, but you don't wanna take somebody to the OR with severe end organ dysfunction. You wanna reverse all the organ dysfunction either by using a balloon or an impella or something else. And you gotta correct their shock. You don't take somebody to the OR to do cabbage to treat a shock. I'm not talking about an acute shock from an acute MI, I'm talking about a patient in heart failure with known coronary artery disease. Um, what determines the surgical risks? There are multiple factors. I think the target vessels and the ejection fraction um, are, and, and their baseline cardiogenic shock are the most important predictors. And um, as Claudia mentioned, putting an intraoperative balloon pump preoperatively for stabilization improves outcomes in select patients. Um, this is a demonstration of how unloading the ventricle uh, pre-op can improve uh, physiologically the parameters and enhance the outcomes of cabbage. Um, when you use different mechanical support options, um, such as impella, ECMO, um, you gotta be very cognizant that even though the impella decompresses the LV, the ECMO does not. ECMO preserves cardiac output, but does not decompress the heart. So it doesn't really rest the heart. So putting them on ECMO may not be optimal for recovery. Thus we use ECPELLA, ECMO and impella in many situations. And um, again, this is beyond the scope of this talk and we're running out of time, but uh, there's pros and cons for using ECMO. Um, this is a demonstration that the afterload and the preload increase with ECMO alone. So again, you preserve the cardiac output with ECMO, but you don't decompress the heart. So the recovery may not be optimal. When you use ECMO and Impella, you decrease the afterload and the preload, and you get a better chance of myocardial recovery. Well, postoperatively, they're gonna to have to be on optimal medical therapy. We evaluate them at six to 12 weeks to see if they need an ICD or a CRT. Um, there's a heart failure specialist that in, that's involved from the beginning. And we go back to our patient. What did we do? Well, we did a PET scan that showed viability. So overall, there was 90% viability. So he had acceptable targets and viability, and he's a young guy. So we actually used bilateral mammary for this guy. We did a cabbage times four, lead to LAD, read to OM, saphenous OM2, SVG to PDA. We did put a balloon pump. He was extirpated day one and discharged home day eight. We did not use a radial because we anticipated the use of pressors. And this is his echo at eight weeks. So his EF improved from 15 to 40% and we saved him a cardiac transplant. But there are situations that we would use VAD instead of cabbage. And that is in patients with heart failure who have poor prognosis or those who are poor candidates for cabbage. These are the predictors of poor prognosis for survival overall. And these are the high risk situations for cabbage, poor targets, hostile mediastinum, poor conduits. That's why we do uh, mapping before the surgery. We don't wanna go to the OR, open the chest and say, oh, oh, there's no conduits or no suitable conduits, let's back off. And there's a physiologic risk of a severely dilated ventricle um, 
degree of ventricular dysfunction disproportional to the ischemic burden. Maybe they have amyloidosis. If their disease is not critical and they have such bad um, LVs and RVs, maybe there's another infiltrative process that's affecting the heart. And we see that with amyloid and sarcoidosis. And this is a summary of what to do in a patient with uh, low EF and heart failure requiring cabbage. That's in the document. But the keys to success are good targets, viable myocardium, good RV, um, not massively dilated LV. Um, you need to do complete revascularization. You need to have good myocardial protection and optimal medical therapy. Conclusions, cabbage prolongs life and reduces MIs in patients with stable coronary artery disease. multi arterial grafting enhances the advantage of cabbage. Cabbage and heart failure requires specialized care. PCI and medical management are supplementary. I mean, they're complementary to surgery. So we should make sure that our patients are receiving optimal medical therapy and do PCI as needed. And the heart team uh, should be driven by evidence and do what's best for the patient. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Bekin, for excellent presentation as always. So we may have questions now. If anyone has a question, you can unmute his mic and ask the question. I may start with a <clears throat> question in terms of training. Do you think we should just shift the gear and training the residents toward these new advanced, maybe advanced cabbage, rather than teaching them the classic, I would say, just lima to LAD and three three vein grafts, and then to have it as a fellowship after graduating, or we have to start early. Yeah, good question, uh, Dwight. I think it's important to get the basics. Um, that cath that I showed you with a patient living on the lima to LAD. In 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 most patients, perhaps lima to LAD is really what's going to determine the long-term survival. Multi-arterial grafting makes sense in patients where the LAD is not huge. So if you get a wraparound LAD that supplies the anterior and inferior aspect of the heart, um, and you just put a lima and veins, that's fine. But if you get a LAD that barely reaches the apex of the heart, and then you get a huge OM, then that patient, especially if they're young, would benefit from having a lima to the LAD and another arterial graft to that huge OM. Because in essence, the LAD becomes a co-dominant vessel with that OM and, and both are gonna contribute to the survival of that patient. But that anatomy is not very common. So I would say that, and, and don't take it, uh, take it as off the record, if you graduate and you know how to do a LITA to LAD perfectly well, then in 90% of your patients, um, you at least did not harm them and you gave them a good operation. For those remaining 10% with anatomies that are favorable to multi-arterial grafting and a clear cut favorable to multi-arterial grafting, then maybe you should ask your colleague who is comfortable with multi-arterial grafting to scrub with you to help for the first few cases. Or maybe you could do a fellowship and be comfortable uh, with multi-arterial grafting. And when you do multi-arterial grafting, you should start incrementally. Don't start doing those fancy uh, composite grafts, sequentials. Um, maybe start with the radial because the radial is more forgiving than the uh, RETA. And then incrementally um, up your game. Um, I would say that for the first 100 cabbages, make sure that you have a perfect outcome. So maybe you wouldn't use multi-arterial grafting for the first 100 cases. After the first 100, you could start slowly um, using more complicated constructs. Because if you have a bad outcome in your first 100 cases, they're going to say you're a bad surgeon. But if you have a bad outcome in your 1,000 case, they're going to say, oh, it was a bad case. So I, I want to make sure that you guys are successful in your careers. And I'm sure all of you, I mean, I, I see that as somebody who works with lots of residents and fellows, 
I would say that 95% of you will be great surgeons and 4% can be trained to be um, good surgeons. And 1%, I'm sorry, um, maybe you should do cardiology. I mean, that's life. And on, on this call, we have almost 50. So I, I, I would say that uh, 44 participants, I would say 44 of you um, uh, can be good surgeons, no doubt about it. Thank you. Okay. So, any other question? Is uh, in the United States um, arteriography moving into a subspecialty? Um, we're seeing more and more people um, advertise themselves as multi arterial and advertise training programs. Um, but still, there are hardcore uh, people, especially the established practice that resist. And I understand why they resist. Uh, there are multiple reasons for that. Um, but we certainly do multi-arterial grafting way less than is done in Europe and even less than what's done in Canada. Um, so so I, I, think, I think now that TAVR is taking away and the transcatheter mitral are taking away cases from the valve surgeons. We're seeing more and more surgeons uh, doing more cabbages and trying to differentiate themselves. So uh, unfortunately, they're doing it for the wrong reason, which is marketing rather than actually helping their patients. Um, again, to this day, as you saw, only 34% of my patients get multi arterial grafting because I simply believe that the other uh, 56%, uh, sorry, uh, 60, 65%, 64%, or 66%, um, basically two thirds may not be suitable candidates. Either they're too sick, too old, or they don't have suitable anatomies. For those that tell you, hey, 90% of my practice is multi arterial, well, I want to move them. And I believe them because if you live in New York where uh, Craig Smith lives, you know, they're all thin, tall, um, they take care of themselves, um, the diabetes is well controlled. They have favorable anatomy and physiology for multi grafting. But if you go to the Midwest where there's lots of obesity, smoking, um, poor compliance, then I sympathize with very low multi grafting. Uh, Dr. McKinney, if you allow me, this is uh, Faisal, a uh, resident from King Faisal Hospital. Um, uh, Lynn. Uh, so, do you, do you have an uh, age limit for uh, uh, arterial, uh, complete arterial uh, revascularization or uh, using uh, bilateral uh, mammary? This is one question. And another question you mentioned uh, one point about. Uh, the muscle mass and 75%. Uh, how do you usually quantify that? I mean, by the angio or uh, if you can elaborate more, please. Yeah, thank you, Faisal. Good questions. So age, um, I, I look at the physiologic age. Um, yesterday's case was 70 years old and I used all arterial. Um, again, uh, people say I only use all arterial. Again, they're, they're more fanatics than scientists. Um, I happen to have beautiful memories that are big that I used and I didn't use, need to use vein, but if I needed to use vein in a 70 year old, that's fine, you know, use vein. So there's, in my books, there's no age cutoff. Um, I look at the physiologic age because sometimes you get a 66 who looks like 88. Um, so you look at the physiologic age, but in general, and if you look at the data, it seems to suggest that after 70, it's hard to show a difference. So many people um, use 70 as a cutoff. Um, it's reasonable, but it's in my books, it's not always necessar necessarily the case. Now, with regards to the importance of the tight vessel, really it's a visual thing. Uh, you look at the cath and if you see a big vessel that reaches more than 75% towards the apex of the heart, then that's an important vessel. But I also in, in the manuscript in Jack, also elaborated, I reviewed, reviewed all those cats. If you, let's say it reaches about 60 or almost 70%, but it has branches, 
and you could visually estimate that there's quite a bit of substantial myocardium supplied by that, o that OM, then that OM is important. It doesn't have to be 75% precisely. It could be less, but visually, the area supplied by it is large. That's how I, so, so it's really more um, eyeball test or eyeball determination than a, um, a standardized testing tool. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, Dr. Bakin, you mentioned some of the quality control measures that you usually do in your cases. Do you, is, is this a standard for all cases? And do you have any other measures? Like, do you assist the aorta for calcification? Do you use aortic ultrasound or CT scan before surgery? Um, so epi aortic ultrasound, I use selectively. Um, I tend to get a CT scan on most of my patients. Um, again, as I said, many would think that with experience, you do less testing. I have moved to more testing. Um, yesterday, there was a case of my colleague who did a CT scan pre-op that showed some calcium in the ascending aorta. He didn't show it to me, but in the OR he called me because when he did the aortotomy to do the proximal, there was toothpaste coming out, toothpaste atheroma coming out of the um, aortotomy that he did for the proximal. So what would you do, Lai? That could be a board question. So, so there's a patient on the table, your colleague calls you and says, hey, I just completed one of the distals and um, did the orthotomy and found this toothpaste atheroma coming out. What would you do? For, for me, I wouldn't do the, the anastomosis. Maybe if it can be done by end you later, I would just accept the, the distal and that. If he, if he had a Lima to LAD. Uh, yeah, this guy needed a cabbage times four and he hadn't done the Lima. He only did vein to PDA. And what he does is that he does a distal proximal, distal proximal. So he was gonna do the proximal of the vein to the PDA and then run into that scenario. Yeah, I mean, this is real life. This happened yesterday. <laughs> If I can do one of the fancy arterial, uh, like to connect these veins to, to I don't know, maybe to, to the, to the Lima or. Oh, you have a number of solutions. Oh, oh. So he actually did an epiaortic ultrasound, amazingly enough because he did see a little calcium on the aorta and uh, he used it to locate the cannula and the clamp size. And he used palpation to decide where to go with the proximal lesions, uh, the proximal aortotomies. So you're saying that you could take that vein graft off the mammary and stay an aortic, huh? Yeah. Uh, or you can. So, so I, you, you could do that. You could do that. I mean, remember the guys on pump and the water is a clamp. You could do that if the lima is of adequate size and the vein is not too big and too thick. You're right. You could, you could take the vein off the mammary. You probably have to extend the vein to reach the mammary. So you probably have to sew another segment of vein to make it reach the proximal mammary and do an anastomosis there and base everything off the left mammary. You can take the right mammary, but the clamp is on, and you know if you're fully heparinized. But any other options here? Is this the best option? Is this going to make you pass the board, Loai, or is it going to dig you a deeper hole at the and time of your oral boards? You can go ahead and change the sending hour. To okay. Okay. Good. Good. 
And, 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 and actually, let me give you another piece of information. And as I was looking, um, the um, assistant was saying, hey, through the root vent, we're sucking out some mush as well. So that's a bad situation. Anybody else wants to give solutions? Um, if you allow me. Yeah. So, so uh, I will proceed with the ascending uh, replacement, uh, providing that uh, uh, prox uh, I mean proximal part is uh, for the aorta is uh, healthy uh, around the clap. If it is uh, still not healthy, uh, we'll go for uh, circulatory arrest and uh, try to do either rahimi arch or part of that. So how do you know that, Faisal? How, how are you going to know if it's healthy or not? Uh, well, because I'm going to cut uh, for the ascending graft at that time. If it oh. is, uh, yeah, uh, I will inspect that. If it is diseased, then I need to extend even more. Okay. Perfect answer. You passed the board. I think between you guys, you passed the board. So what we did is this. I, I went in and I saw that stuff come out. So I thought, well, let's start incrementally, step at a time. So I did an aortotomy like you do for an aortic valve. I, I opened and looked because I thought, well, maybe if it's localized to that specific area, we can irrigate, clean it, close that site and go somewhere else. But when she told me that she's sucking stuff through uh, the assistant, through the <coughs> root vent, and when I opened and looked, everything looked like toothpaste all the way up to the clamp. So I told the perfusionist to cool. We cooled for 25 minutes. Uh, the bladder temperature was 28. He was a big guy. And, and as we were cooling, I put an SVC cannula and encircled the SVC because I was worried that he may have already embolized stuff. So we went circa rest after 25 minutes, giving retrograde cerebral perfusion to flush out any debris. Luckily, um, the atherome extended all the way up, but just short of the cannulation site, but we cut out the cannulation site and the innominate and the carotid and the head vessels were totally clear of disease. And we did, um, you know, a, a conservative hemi arch or almost a distal ascending. Circle rest time was about 12 minutes and uh, we replaced the ascending. So, what uh, Luai addressed was if you knew ahead of time that the award is bad and you don't want to manipulate it, then you base, you do an aortic technique, you use the mammary inflows uh, to supply the heart without touching the award and you do it off pump. But if you're in the middle of it and you run into that situation, then uh, Faisal is correct. You need to assess uh, the extent of the atheroma. And uh, if there's any doubt, do that circle rest that we did yesterday. So um, that's what we did. And the patient woke up and uh, is doing well. So the quality control, you try and prevent those situations by doing a CT and if you see calcification there, sometimes it gives you a hint on the CT scan that this calcification is part of a thick wall. Even without contrast, you could kind of guesstimate that that wall of the aorta is not normal. And then you could do an epiaortic ultrasound. And we use a flow probe setting that has an epiaortic or a, uh, epicardial probe that we use to look at the aorta. And we also use it to find target vessels in redos or deep intramyocardial target vessels. Um, we also use it for dissections uh, to cannulate centrally for the true lumen. We pass a wire under ultrasound guidance into the true lumen. So that's why we use it for quality control um, um, in terms of flow. And we use it for quality control selectively for epi scanning. And if we are very happy uh, with everything, we don't have to do a CTA before discharge uh, because we're confident that the um, anastomosis is open. But for a mid-cap, I always, I, I don't know why, it's a habit of mine. I, I do a flow meter in the OR and I also do a CTA before discharge, just as a belt and suspender, just to make absolutely sure that I did not screw anything up. I mean, if, if anybody tells you, hey, my patency rate is 
either they're not being fully honest or they haven't done enough cases or they haven't examined their results. I mean, even if you do a perfect anastomosis, sometimes um, the graft will go down either because there was a hematoma um, or a dissection that wasn't manifest or um, a chest tube compression. I mean, anything could happen. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other question? Uh, hi, Dr. Faisal. This is uh, uh, Muhammad Jalal. I'm a, a final year resident from King Fahd Armed Forces Hospital in Jeddah. Hey, Muhammad. Um, and, um, maybe from the other end of the spectrum, from uh, multiple arterial grafting, um, are there any patients uh, that you would, uh, or in any situation that you would uh, decide to go all veins? Uh, and if yes, or, or if not, uh, then why? All veins, um, very, 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 very rare. Um, because remember, the what differentiates cabbage from PCI is really the lima or the arterial grafts. So, um, so in those situations, I would ask that the cardiologist stand them if I'm not gonna use an arterial graft, but let's say that they can't stand them and let's say that they have bad radiation damage to their mammaries uh, and the mammaries are unusable and the radials, they've got Raynaud's disease. Actually, I had this case where they had Raynaud's disease. Um, I used bilateral mammaries because they weren't radiated, but let's say they were radiated um, and we, we demonstrated poor flow in the mammaries and um, on, on pre-op ultrasound imaging, and we can't use the radials and their vein looks beautiful on vein mapping, then yes, that would be a patient that they couldn't stent and I can't use the mammaries or the radials. So I would use the good quality saphenous vein. Thank you. Well, I, um, I, I'm happy to spend another couple of minutes, but it seems like we slowed down a little bit. Um, you guys are welcome to email me if you have other questions um, um, or reach out to me through you or independently. Um, I'll try my best to respond in a timely manner. Um, sure. And, and I'm happy to help in any way I can. Thank you very much for this great opportunity to have you today and, and hopefully we'll have you maybe in another time, maybe in Riyadh next time, inshallah. Inshallah, I'd be honored. I thank you for the opportunity. It's uh, great to chat with all of you and uh, it's a small world. I'm sure I'm gonna see most of you here in the US, in Europe or in the Middle East. Uh, my regards to everybody in Saudi. It's been an honor. Yeah. Yeah, sure, uh, you're part of the Revascularization Society, the, the, the uh, International Society for Myocardial Revascularization. Yeah, the ICC, yes, I, I am a member, and actually I'm a member of the program committee. Is that what you're referring to, the ICC? Yeah, 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 exactly, I, exactly that. You know, when is the next meeting? It's in New York in person. Um, I had the dates on me, let me see if 22, I have 22, 22 maybe. No, it's, it's, I have it on my calendar here. Uh, it's December 3rd through 5th. 21, 21st. December 3rd. December no, no, 3rd. meaning the year, the year. Yeah, yeah, the, this year, this year. Uh, in this December, year, December. Too. Yes. Yeah. Okay, fine, good to see you. Yeah, so hopefully, I don't know if they're going to have a hybrid or an in-person, uh, but I'm sure there's going to be an in-person component. So Claudio, awesome. hopefully I'll meet you then, or and and maybe many of you uh, guys. We hope, I hope we hope to see you here in uh, in Riyadh to enjoy life. You know the <laughs> jokes about about uh, Cleveland. You know the jokes about Cleveland. Um, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> you know, yeah, yes. Uh, there is a this guy just uh, getting back. Uh, you know, to the doctor uh, surgery and uh, wondering how oh, I just got cancer. He told me. I got one year of life, you know, and he come, comes, goes back to the doctor. Excuse me, doctor, can I ask you a question? 
there is any mean to extend my year of life with this cancer. So the guys, uh, the doctor thinks a little about, I mean, well, I'm doubtful, but maybe, maybe you, you can move to Cleveland and marry a Jewish woman. They say, how is, um, well, uh, the doctor explains that there won't be more than 12 months, but it will be the longest year of your life. <laughs> That's funny. That's really, really funny. So, inshallah, I will see you in New York and, uh, and in Riyadh. Okay. Inshallah. No, but I, I, would have, I, would have, I would have recommended an Italian woman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You are not the first who told then, me. Then, but then, I, I, but no, I don't. then they will actually live longer. I don't. Longer. Have to meet and I will tell you why. <laughs> okay. Very well. Great okay, pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Take so care, much. guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you, everyone. So, Muhammad, are you happy to present your lecture? Hi, how are you? Uh, why? I need one hour. If you can give me five, okay. Or this week. How is your life? Right, we can maybe postpone it to next week. Thank you very much. So, see you next week, inshallah. Thank you, Life.